Hi guys. So I am very excited about this next interview. I did my very first three person chat and it actually went, I'd say pretty well. It's a little on the long side at about around two hours, but I really encourage you to listen to the whole thing because we go through quite a bit of what applied postmodernism is. And I think in a sort of easy to understand way, because I was looking for that, because I want to understand exactly what applied postmodernism is. Uh, some people call those who subscribe to it uh, social justice warriors or the social justice left. But this really gets to the groundwork of the epistemology of it. So to just give a little background, James Lindsay along with Helen Pluckrose and Peter Bogosian, wrote papers that actually got into academic journals. And they're called hoax papers, but they actually, the papers themselves weren't hoaxes. They actually wrote from the perspective of these grievance studies literature. So Jim is coming from that space, from this sort of academic space of grievance studies. And then Mike is the one making a documentary about this whole grievance study affair, it isn't finished, but he made a different documentary about Evergreen State College where it's the event that uh, Brett Weinstein exited as a result of. And I guess it focuses on the day of absence and the events leading up to the day of absence. I'll link Mike's uh, YouTube channel in the description so you can go watch it if you like. I really encourage you to watch it because it's excellent. And so that's where we're starting here for the interview. Uh, we just kind of go in right away start talking about these things. So I'm going to stop talking. This is just, it was a treat to speak to both of these guys. And um, I hope you guys enjoy it. Hello, Mike. Hey. Hey, and hey, Jim. Hey. Hey, okay. Thank you so much for coordinating our three time zones. Yeah, cool. Okay, so why I, the reason why I wanted to speak with you both is I I kind of get this sense that your project, the Grievance Studies project, and then Mike, your um, your Evergreen uh, documentary that just came out. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's our societies changing, and that these two things are very important. And mm -hmm. they're not just one-offs. To me, I I kind of want to get to the bottom of, with this conversation, I mean, we're totally going to solve it. But, I mean, we have to have these conversations <laughs> to articulate, like, what is happening. I want to I wanna see what's happening. Yeah. What's happening in our culture? What does this mean? Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, thoughts, initial thoughts. Oh, well, Jim, did you want to, do you want to take this one to start? Sure. I, I think we're seeing a culture-wide shift that's been going on for about 30 years and has kind of come to fruition. It's been coming out of some scholarship that's been going on in the academies and being taught to students and fed to activists and packaged up ways that they can apply. And I think where you see the connection is that at Evergreen, you had a closed system that hit critical mass with this stuff, and it just blew up. So we now have a shift in society to where people are evaluating society not at the level of the individual, not at the level of ideas, not at the level of um, things like merit, reason, evidence, and so on, and that they're seeing people in terms of group identity where group is an identity or a demographic group. And it's all taken to be understood in terms of systems of power that disenfranchise certain groups and unfairly advantage or privilege other groups. And it's stoking a lot of social grievances that are now manifesting in just about every walk of life. And so, Mike, what did you know? Like, you're kind of us looking in because you weren't being doing the scholarship you're you're just making the the film and of course i imagine mm -hmm. you understand it now but when you first came into this what did you initially think of what the world of grievance studies even though we didn't i don't know that the term was coined before but what did you think yeah. of, of like the woke culture i guess before 
Well, yeah, it's, it seemed to me that there was a shift taking place. Um, my way into this was was activists. I just thought, saw activism was changing, and it just it seemed to me that activism became uh, quite destructive, and there was this authoritarian element to it. Um, these and people who were activists tend to they were using their similar language. They they were dressing the same. There was there was something going on that was beyond like I want specific change. Um, so I started monitoring that and started going to a lot of protests, speaking to a lot of activists. And I mean, it, it's, it was quite easy to trace that back to the, their language, really, and their definitions back to the academy, because that's it, they're, they're using these quite specialized terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, things like cis normativity, for, for instance, or redefining racism as some kind of uh, structural thing, like everyday racism becomes structural. It, it was it was that was a changing of a definition to me and I was like well, where, did, where did that come from mm. and so it was I just I traced I traced that upstream to the academy and to me it was yeah I mean, I mean it was clear that all these different definitions were being changed and there was a philosophy underneath this thing and so it's it seemed big to me because the, the way I describe it is um, there's a philosophical schism underneath the political back and forth because okay. we're very divided, right, on, on like so many issues. And the emotional charge that's going on um, for the, these, 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 you know, skirmishes, these political skirmishes is, is too much. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's beyond what the actual uh, political discussion should, should really be emotionally. Okay. And so well, some way I've been describing it, well, this is how I started to understand it, was there was some, something deeper. So if you, if you think about a, a couple um, in a relationship, if, if there's something foundational that's wrong, like maybe one person cheated on someone or something like that, um, something, something is shift, it's shifted in their worldviews. And then all of a sudden, when you go up to the top, they'll find themselves fighting over the dishes or, you know, right. fighting over who ate the last Tim Tam or something like that. And those arguments will hold so much more emotional weight than they should. But they really should just be talking about the, 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 the schism, right? The, the philosophical or just, just deep, deep problem that they have because there's a lot of work that has to be done. Is it the activists that are the ones... Going against the, like talking about well, the dishes is that for me, it, for me it looks like it's a completely different worldview that's being designed in the in the in the academy. So that it's it's a philosophical and the further you go down and further you, really, there's metaphysical assumptions in this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not political level. It's not philosophical level. Shit. It's actually philos It's metaphysical. And so this okay. is why when the deeper you go into this stuff, you're like, oh, hold, they're fully um, they're the, the assumptions that are embedded in these top level political ideas are actually a different view of reality. Um, so you started not, yeah, almost all outside, like the top down. So you almost started outside and then like went in when you started like under you said the language of the protesters was what brought you, I guess, to the core of it? So it's it's like I I started with the fighting and the fighting of uh, over the dishes right. and going there's something wrong here, okay. and then I started looking like looking at at the the different sides and thinking and looking looking further and further down, and then all of a sudden you get the more you read and the more you look and the more you try and figure out their 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 moral foundations, okay, um, and all, all all this there's 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 deeper and deeper things going on here that we need to address, um. Otherwise, there's no way we there's no way we we meet on these on political issues unless we get the 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 bottom layer philosophical stuff. And it's, it's a shift. Yeah. It's 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 a shift. It's like it's strange. We found ourselves. I I think we found ourselves in in a in a time of of, of huge shifts. So it's uh, it's 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 quite. I don't know, Jim. Do you have anything yeah, to say so, on that? So I over kind of, to the to the the foundation that that Mike mm -hmm. was talking about. If you could elaborate mm -hmm. on that, Jim. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and to be clear, actually, Peter and Helen and I started at the level of these dishes arguments oh. as well, and we noticed again that, in particular, definitions were being changed and vocabulary was being used that seemed terribly academic. And uh, I mean, the fingerprints of, of academic of academic thought were all over this. This wasn't normal activism. These were, you know, six-syllable oh. words for everything. 
And the okay. systemic racism thing was in particular, I remember the first time I looked up systemic racism or tried to figure out why people were being called racist in terms of the systems. And I saw that the definition was, it was one of those things where it was, you know, racism and it gives you the definition prejudice based on skin color, race, whatever. And then the next thing down is like parentheses sociology. And then it's like the definition these people are using. I was like, holy crap, it's right out of social science. And then digging deeper, we got into the, the point where it's, as Mike was saying, a very deep philosophical divergence, uh, two, two worldviews, actually, one that is postmodern, and then one, I don't know exactly, I mean, I've dug too deep into the philosophy now, and you can't call it modern because that was its own thing and gets complicated, but there's this kind of thing that was before postmodernism that was kind of an amalgam of, of enlightenment thinking and uh, traditional liberalism, mm -hmm. and then it kind of sees the world in terms of evidence and objective reality exists. We have access to at least provisional knowledge of objective reality, and we call those things objective truths that aren't dependent on our subjective experience of them. And the postmodern view rejects that completely. It indicates that our the only thing we can, whether objective reality exists or not, the only thing we can know about it is our subjective experience of it, and therefore everything that matters, everything that is knowledge is subjective, and objective knowledge is completely inaccessible. Um, and then this has gone further, and it's it's focused ever since the postmodern turn on on the use of language to this determine what is and is not able to be treated as true or who has political authority or access. And then it really got invested in these systems of power, uh, how we use language to legitimize what what we consider to be knowledge, and therefore we exclude certain people who don't use language correctly. And we keep them oppressed and marginalized and we don't take seriously their claims and all of these ideas. And then somewhere along the lines, it got really invested in nailing down concrete statements about which identities are marginalized and why. And we've since identified that that was somewhere starting in the late 80s, going into the 90s and into the early 2000s. There was this huge conceptual shift that really kind of came along with intersectionality. I was thinking they, that, yeah. Yeah, there was really an effort to nail down why certain uh, demographics, be that women, uh, people of color, if you will, various different shades of people of color, you know, different ability status, trans, you know, whatever it is. This They called it a matrix of, of oppression or matrix of domination. That's a term by uh, intersectional scholar from the late eighties and early nineties. Is that Kim Patricia Collins? Oh, okay. I, is Kimberly Crenshaw the one who created intersectionality as a? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Kimberly Crenshaw was a critical race theorist and legal scholar who uh, coined the term intersectionality in a paper in the late eighties called "Mapping the Margins." Okay. And she explicitly at the end of that paper says that that intersectionality is a framework through which we can apply postmodernism to solve problems in the world. And what it begins with is acknowledging that demographic identity is real and oppression based on identity is real. Where early postmodernists didn't accept that really anything is real, it's all just, just language. Right. So you have this huge divergence of how people view the world. You have these kind of I don't want to use the word classical liberal, but you have this kind of like blend of classical liberals, which is kind of an enlightenment thing, and traditional liberals and modernists who kind of view the world one way, like merit matters, evidence matters, reason matters, and so on. And then you have an objective reality is something we can talk about and know something about. Many of these postmodernists who say that everything is a locally mediated truth. And then the more recent manifestation of that, the intersectionalists say, and it's all rooted in the way language is used to maintain systems of power that disadvantage certain uh, groups of people, in particular these groups, and therefore group identity is very important to describing really their there's experience. A, there's an important distinction so here. There's an important distinction here between the old school postmodernists and what we've true. been calling uh, applied postmodernists, postmodernism, right. because the the old postmodernists. They're getting blamed for a lot of this stuff, but there's this, it's, it's kind of hard to explain to academics that, um, that this, this manifestation of it now, this applied postmodernism, is, is postmodernism at all because it, it is a different thing. So they, they've created all these tools, these, these 
kind of analytical tools, these kind of uh, these cr- tools of criticism, um, right. which just dismantle everything. And so these these French postmodernists declared year zero in the academy, and then they just dismantled everything. And then you've got this applied turn in what is, is the late eighties, right? It was the late eighties. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. it was early in late eighties. Yeah, it really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of began through the eighties. There were conceptual shifts going on. It was eighty seven and eighty nine were kind of the seminal papers that really shifted it into high gear. That's where Kimberly Crenshaw's papers started. And, to come and, out. and you've, you've got Butler coming to the head, head of her fame there. So there's, there's a few big names that are going through this this theory this theory uh, phase of it. Um, and it's it, these are two these are two quite different entities. Um, they're different and the same, right? There's one where it's just going nothing. It's nihilistic. It's it's just it's taking everything apart. It's 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 dismantling every everything that was came before it, and then they've taken that year zero, <laughs> and then they've, yeah. they've built on it since. And so they've built their their own line, their own worldview off this this blank slate worldview that has power and stuff like that. So it's it's like it's this thing that, that's, that's built out. And so we've got people who are still living in the old way of thinking. And then you've got these people who have this completely new way of thinking. And it's, you know, I, I understand it on a kind of metaphysical slash theological level. It's, it's a, it's a competing kind of religion in a way. Um, no, we yeah, that's I right. Out how, to, how, to, how to talk about this stuff yet. So I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of riffing right now, but um, that's, that's, that's how I'm starting to understand what's going on here. I've heard of, you know, like Foucault and like those, the French postmodernists, I've heard of them. And yeah, I, I didn't really know what to do. I just thought they were all in the same. So applied postmodernists, would they agree with those French postmodernists? Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. So that's like where Kimberly Crenshaw, if you read at the end of Mapping the Margins, she explicitly says that the old postmodernists, um, like the old postmodernism couldn't achieve the kinds of goals that she wanted. And even Foucault was pointing this out. Foucault was very keen on power. He was obsessed with the idea of power, as a matter of fact, is the best way to put it. And he insisted and domination that, really like, well yeah that's the thing is you, you can't him, get rid of he was like he, he liked all this s and m cup stuff so he was right. really oh, into like, it but he, anyway go really, on he went there okay oh yeah yeah okay. torture, so for, torture. go on so for him you couldn't get rid of systems of, of dominance and power because as soon as as soon as you overthrow or disrupt one the new thing that comes up is going to take power and it's the new target. And so he was just kind of despairing that there was always going to be cycles and systems of power and people would be dominated. And, and that makes sense. This to is me. really what he was yeah. about. That makes sense right. to me well, that he would think that because that's logical. Yeah. Mm. Right. And I, he's probably actually somewhat right about that. Then these applied postmodernists, mostly following the lead of critical race theory and some of the more conspiratorial thoughts within um, what was kind of the budding edge of third wave feminism really wanted to nail down no certain demographic groups have historically been marginalized and the way that the systems of power have been cooked up, they can't possibly fully overthrow those and gain power themselves. So they're forever marginalized. They're forever oppressed. They are actually completely cheated by the system. And so Within this new applied postmodern thinking, they say that what we have to do is completely get rid of binaries. So if there's a if there's a binary one side, according to I think this was this was Derrida, who but it maybe is Lyotard. I get them confused, um, insisted that one side of every binary is superior and one side is inferior. So there's your power. Yeah, that was Derrida. And because he said all words appear in language. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all all binaries. Meaning comes from the binary. Right. right. And so the, the new objective within applied postmodernism is to overthrow all binaries, so that they're, which is to utterly deconstruct meaning, really, uh, if we follow from Derrida. So they, they've done this by, by trying to essentially cook up ways where the people who are oppressed are always oppressed and they have to continually fight for liberation from their oppression and so it's kind of where Mike says it ties into like theology, and I don't know a ton about this, but there's actually a line of thought that came up 
within some religious circles that's called liberation theology, and liberation is kind of the centerpiece of this thing. So there's this whole idea that that, that the goal is to liberate ourselves from these power dynamics entirely and not reproduce them, although they're set up to constantly try to perpetuate, legitimize, and reproduce themselves. So it's really it really took on some conspiratorial elements. And uh, I think that actually it mostly came from the influence of critical race theory, which seems to have taken that tack um, leading into Crimbilly Crenshaw's formulation of intersectionality. And everything sort of blew up with this applied postmodern thing following the intersectional turn. Right. Okay. So that's something I wanted to ask. What is legitimate about these um these theories because i i think of i guess going back to the original post postmodernism like year zero like you said mike i'm thinking of language does construct meaning right so mm-hmm. that's true yeah. i don't think it's necessarily a bad thing but it is right it, it, that true, true, something... and well, it's true from this this kind of uh, detached statistical, you know, text view of the world. But I mean, anyone that's kind of learnt a new language, you you go, you go into a room, and while you're learning it, you're you are referencing things because you're you're having you're trying you're discussing the the setting of the room is 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 important into your your understanding of the meaning of what's going on the things that are on the table the body the body language there's there's more there's there's more to meaning than the language itself it, right. it strikes me as as the 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 there's the, there's issues here right there's issues here i think it i think it, it's very it's a keen keen insight from a very text point of view but once you yeah, start think... step out in the real world it, it 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 diverges a little bit okay yeah i think there's there's legitimacy to pointing out that there is an impenetrable barrier between our subjective experience and reality and we try to yeah, cross that yeah. barrier through language right. so that which we know we know in terms of words which we construct into things that we call models and then the model is like a map in a sense it's not the thing itself but it's hard. It's harder for me as an artist to to accept that because you people dance and people uh, paint and it's, there's different there's different ways of getting at meaning. And I, 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 yeah, I, I I agree. I agree. Well, it's um, just a part. Like the the thing. The reason why I I say this is because I tend to um, and I think a lot of well, I think most people do this is that you kind of hear something you think you find troubling and so like that whole thing is bad. So I, I actually was like, so the whole social construction thing, I'm like, nothing is socially constructed. Oh, it's right. all yeah, objective. Yeah. You know, like yeah, I yeah. kind of yeah. went a little no, in my head a little will. far. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I kind of have to walk it back, when, yeah. which is why I'm saying, okay, well, what is true about, okay, I'm like, okay, well, language to an extent is a social construct, like to an extent, it, you know, yeah, like yeah. The, I mean, modern words you can go in evolutionary biology and look at like i guess chimps and they kind of like yeah. laugh and stuff you know and they might have whatever but but you there are some things where there's you know bits of truth but it's only one part like what you were saying Mike, oh, yeah. about the... I, I, these, these people aren't idiots that's the thing sometimes i hear people going oh so these guys are corrupt idiots and i'm like no these are very very smart people they just they're just thinking in different terms and particularly the, the early postmodernists, I think they've got some keen insights. I think that we can't shake them either. We're probably going to go forward with, with, with something, you know, without the moral element of what, what they've put into the world. But um, What is the yeah, moral I, element? Like, what, what is that? The moral? The whole power thing. It's right. like if, okay. you can, if you can get rid of, if you can be more objective <laughs> about it, and you just use, use it as a possible view of a uh, way to view something and then and then find a different way to use it these, these these insights are actually really great but i mean if you if you just if you turn it into a obsession about power and restructuring man they are like well, and women but this is how they used to talk but um if you restructure you, they they're doing it to restructure the human the human and society and all this sort of thing and it's like you're 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 playing god what are you doing there so they're using they're using these keen insights to to 
um, reshape. They're kind of academocrats. They're, uh, they're, <laughs> they're, they're reshaping society with these statistical insights and things like that. Um, well, yeah, I don't think it's statistics, Mike. <laughs> Just, uh, it's, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I'm glad you hear that. I'm it's using theory. It's, it's theory. Like, yeah, you know it's what I mean? Like, it's detached from reality in, in, my, in my perspective. It's like bean counting or something like that. Yeah, it's, not yeah. the actual it's like thing. the old joke about physicists is uh, if your physicist wants to do a calculation about a cow, he begins with assume the cow is a sphere to take out <laughs> all, all of the relevant details that would make it complicated to look at. And that's kind of what they do with society. And they just try to yeah. look at it in terms of webs of, of power. I think their biggest – I mean they did have some very sharp – insights what we've talked about about social constructions we've talked about about um the subjectivity problem what we've talked we didn't talk about actually was that bias comes from these from from the way that we think about things and that it's more pervasive than we probably thought but they go too far with everything and they try to infuse everything with politics it's that literally they believe that everything is somehow a political project oh. so science proceeds specifically not to find out truths about objective reality, but to find out what truths can be legitimized within the political system that created science. And therefore it would exclude the possibility of other truths that were, were made in other cultural or political systems. And so they try to make everything into a political issue. Um, that goes too far. The idea that social constructions are a thing to be concerned about doesn't, give the the license to believe in full out constructivism that they uh, everything is constructed um, for example and the idea that there are biases doesn't give us license to believe that everything is equally fatally flawed by bias and that no one system can possibly judge or weigh in on another so they had a lot of things where they just went way too far it was this kind of total despair that all of humans so far, all of humanity's efforts to try to sum up life and figure it out and make it work. Christianity, Marxism was big, science, the um, colonialism, all of these things were failing. And they had huge gaps. And so the, these things are what they called meta narratives. These, you know, manifest destiny would be one on the North American continent. Um, the idea that these, these meta narratives that kind of shaped how huge sweeping explanations for how humans do and should be are likely not to be true when you look at the details. Uh, they, 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 that was correct also, but they went way too far with it to a radical skepticism that all such things must be basically completely untrue. And they adopted a thing from modernism, which preceded it, which was critical theory, which is to look at it, find where it, is contradictory within itself in order to render it absurd, in order to overthrow it and replace it with something else. And so there was this huge shift so, in, this in is, thinking this that went way too the far. Postmodernists, um, the, thing, the thing that I find interesting is that the <laughs> postmodernists, they're, they're actually quite good at analyzing the way, you know, the way that humans behave and, um, and they, they, they're dismantling these meta-narratives. But Humans need a meta narrative. Just choose your choose your meta narrative. You're not going to funk. You can't get out of bed bed without some form of you know understanding of the world and you know s s sweeping kind of narrative for how how history became. So it's like you you become depressed if you don't have these things that seem like human universals. And so the applied postmodernists are inadvertently creating their own. And so I want to try and figure out what 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 are they? Yeah, well, what what are their meta narratives then? What are they replacing the old ones with? The the the, the, the human history is some kind of power struggle where where oh that the, the oh the power the, the, the uh, in, throughout history, white man has oppressed everyone, and it doesn't. The history narrative doesn't go back that far. I still haven't figured this out. Would you have a better idea of of what the, what would you say that the postmodern meta narrative would be? The applied postmodernism meta narrative. There's this kind of uh, reparations, or let's try and get back to what could have been if this this dominant force wasn't ruining everything and ruining nature and and our ways of and and creating this complete logical way of thinking yeah i think uh, that that's that's definitely kind of the mythology 
of that meta narrative, and I, it's straightforward. The way that it's applied is that they see society in terms of systems of power that are pushed through identity, and uh, the most important aspect of that is that each system of power is built to be self-reinforcing. The power side always works to make get, uh, to, to maintain itself and, and legitimize this, this itself. Interesting thing, because agency falls out of that. I hope we're not we're not ru- running too far down the track on this but it's right right you you how this manifests in every people's everyday experiences there's this kind of uh equity uber alice kind of thing that's going on and people just they aren't allowed to go about their everyday business because um not fighting racism is racism and so there's this kind of there's this there's this thought that you just going about your business and just just trying to be a good person it's actually reinforcing this this um this power dynamic because you're just using the same language you used to you used to use or you know that the, these right. powerful people in the past have used and right. so in their worldview everyone gets pulled into this political thing because if you're not acting against it you are for it you're, you're perpetuating it so you can be racist without saying anything racist like with, without without saying anything explicitly racist because they they right. have to redefine everything um, yep. I know that that's not very articulate, but that's it's kind of it's how that's these correct. these lower these lower level philosophical you know big shifts are actually manifesting in real life. I think a lot of people experience, oh, oh shit, I didn't know that was racist. I'm sorry, I should search my soul. And it's like it's then they're, they're not. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So I... <laughs> they are in that worldview, but in in the in the in the other side of it, they're just they're going about their business. They're just they're trying to live their life. Well, so. That actually reminds me, there was something that I I thought, okay, because it, it can get convoluted when you're just talking theory. And, and mm. so I found it actually, I asked Jim the other day about why, like on, on DM, on, on Twitter, direct message for any of you who are oh. not on Twitter. Um, so I asked him about why, okay, Christina Hoff Summers did a debate with, Roxanne Gay, and it was kind of a wonder that it happened at all because mm. they don't share platforms. And she kind of, Roxanne regretted doing it. Like she basically said right. that. And so I asked Jim, like, why do they not want to share a platform or debate or whatever? And and the way you described it, explaining it to me, because I thought it was because of contempt and and Jim kind of deconstructed it all. And it actually really was quite, it was this one thing and it made me really understand it. So if you could go through why you wouldn't want to share a platform or debate someone, um, someone's ideas if you are an applied postmodernist. Or- yeah, the main reason is complicity. There are a number of other reasons that are kind of beneath that, but the primary reason is complicity. So if you were to, say, be Roxanne Gay and you wanted to go up with somebody like Christina Hoff Summers, then you are enabling her, Christina Hoff Summers, to have a platform. Therefore, you are complicit in giving her the opportunity to spread the message that she's spreading to everybody that she's spreading it to. And by trying to argue against it, you are having to do so. There, It's expected that there's going to be this civil conversation. Nobody's going to start yelling. In other words, we're going to play by the rules of the civil society that were cooked up specifically so that dominant white people could especially dominant white men, could continue to rule over marginalized uh, women and people of color and sexual minorities. So you have become complicit in a few ways. One, you've given a platform to views that you don't want spread, which could do symbolic violence, for example, to uh, people in the audience. Two, you have become complicit in the system, the system of power by which knowledge claims are supposed to be legitimized that you are actually trying to fight against. So you're now participating in the exact system, the epistemic system, or the set of epistemic resources that is part of what marginalizes people. And so you are actually perpetuating the problem rather than fighting against it, even if you're on the stage fighting against. So it's far more productive from within this worldview to act disruptively. So rather than getting on stage and debating, which is a cis hetero white patriarchal thing to do it's a way that cis hetero white patriarchy sustains itself and legitimizes knowledge it's more productive to stand in the crowd and yell and throw things 
because that disrupts the event. That's not what people expect. That's not participating in the system. In fact, it's rejecting the system and trying to create a different uh, what, what, one, one of the kind of simple ways it's being taught is master's tools. Um, mm-hmm. is, is yeah. it do you want to, do you want to go into my, like you, you'll hear master's tools. They'll yeah. Master's, master's tools. tools. Right. And everyone will go, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. do you want to, do you want to yeah, go? I don't know. Yeah. That, com- that comes from Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord said that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So it's obviously a reference to slaves and slavery. So the idea would be that people who were slaves would never be able to tear down the house that the master built or the system that the master built using the master's own tools. The master wouldn't allow that. So when you take that metaphor out, the master's tools in this case would be civil debate, logical argument, discussion, reason, evidence, and so on. And so those are the master's tools. How can those possibly dismantle the master's house, which is a white cis heteropatriarchy that legitimizes itself using reason, debate, civility, et cetera, uh, reason and evidence and, and all of that. Um, so that belief is pretty fun, foundational. Uh, Audrey Lord, like I said, started it. Bell Hooks really ran with it. She was a major intersectional feminist from uh, the black perspective and she really ran with that idea and wrote quite a lot about it. So you'll see this theme coming up quite a lot that if you are acting and it comes up in various levels of sophistication and we could get really nerdy and talk about how Christy Dotson characterizes the same idea as irreducible epistemic oppression, a third order organizational schema change or something like that's necessary to undo it. But the, the long and short of it is the, that there's a belief that you can't participate in the system by the system's rules and undo that system at the same time. You're just perpetuating the system. So that's and so, a form and so of to try and map, map this on to, to something that, but you know, with with the Evergreen situation, though, though those uh, bell hooks was mentioned when I was looking through all the the footage. Bell hooks is mentioned again and again and again and again, and so. She, she wrote a book, Teaching to Transgress, um, and that was a foundational text for Naima Lowe, um, I discovered. And so that's why I, I named um, episode two, Teaching to Transgress. But it's all, it's all, it's all this stuff. It's all, like, Can you just whole, uh, who, say who watch. Naima Lowe is, just in case people... Yeah, are... yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm getting very in-group here. Um, no, I so... think that the whole thing is kind of in-group, but I figured... I should try to start. No, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely hit me up when I get to in-group. Um, so, so Naima Lowe is, was a teacher at Evergreen State College. So I've recently done a three-part documentary series on the meltdown of Evergreen State College. So uh, from, from my perspective, the Evergreen State College adopted this, this way of thinking that we've been talking about. And uh, in institutionalized it they had an attempt to institutionalize it and uh i i think that the the logical outcome was the implosion so your viewers are probably familiar with so like evergreens become quite famous because it was a campus that imploded because of the, these kind of activists this, this mm-hmm. destructive activism um and some uh, like mind-boggling footage came out of it and so i made a three-part series about that and um it's 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 such a fascinating thing to have happened. It was to me. It's it's uh, it's just so many layers and and so so like it's a beautiful case study for what happens when um, these ideas get rolled out in inside inside a, a kind of uh, a structure. Really, I mean, it's got it's got its governance. It's got the 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 student body, which is the you know the citizens, the, the body politics, yeah. citizens, uh, and then you've got. Um, Food services, police services, housing. It's like this self-contained town almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when, when, you, when the governance picks up, uh, when these ideas are institutionalized, that, that's what happened. These, it was an attempt to institutionalize these ideas. And then all of a sudden you got all this, this like feedback loop of grievance and, and an, ability, an inability to differentiate between what what um, what grievances were legitimate? Because I'm sure there's some legitimate in there. Not many though. Not in that, not in that situation from what I saw. But then there's illegitimate grievances, and there's just no way to unpack them because you're you're looking at things through experience and not objective reality. There's no arbiter to these to these discussions. It's all experience. So you're right. 
Um, and so and no consistency it, 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 either, it, right? Like no consistency to the grieve. Like, I, sorry, the thing that comes to mind is when the teachers are getting chewed out by I think Naima, and one of them it's go in or go home. You mentioned this to me the other day, Jim, go in or go home. And one person says, well, can I, one professor is like, can I just say something? Can I apologize? And then it's just like, how dare you, you go in or go home. Like, but like that seemed like something that people like that would like to get an apology, but they hated it. Like you can't do it right. It seems like it's not consistent for what they're wanting for you to, for if you're maybe like particularly a white well, person. Well, shut up and listen. It's like Naima is a, But then being complicit uh, though, being uh, quiet. Like, but but you need to speak up. Otherwise you're being racist. Like, isn't, can you not win? Like, it, isn't that what it's- No, you can't. It's, <laughs> that's the whole point. You right? can't win. You can't. Because you should be it's speaking- It's Kafka traps and it's about power. So right. it's like, she was just- Speak about, speak against, a, a, yeah, speak against the racism, really, yeah. but then don't speak and listen. And, it, and, and it's like- Wait, what? Like, which which yeah. is it? Wait, well, yeah, the cast, life faculty member the that was trying to... He, he was in a lower cast, so... Um, yeah, well, he was, he was trying to give an apology, and therefore, by doing something that wasn't given as a choice, he was trying to exert agency and buck the system that was, was offered. Oh. He, was, he was basically trying to do something that wasn't offered, and therefore he was trying to assert that he had some form of dominance in the system, even though he was supplicating himself in the system or the situation. Uh, and it was really totally toxic. Mike's actually right. It's a power thing. Oh. And they're, they're setting it up to where they can't lose. And you know that that's happening when you get these kind of contradictory situations where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't or that you're you're guilty if you admit that you're guilty and if you don't admit you're guilty that's proof of your guilt as well you you know that it's just it's a system to where where they are 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 trying to flip the power dynamic to their own advantage and kind of cheat the rules in order to achieve it but you actually can't explain stuff like that within theory it just starts getting really conspiratorial and really weird and you have to start getting pretty deep into some ugly concepts to get there you, uh, you can or you essentially can't you, have a, you can you i can. mean the white person trying you to offer you. you can you absolutely yes you can uh the white person offering the apology was trying to do something with his own agency so he was assuming agency that wasn't offered to him he was he was denying the request of a person of color and trying to do something of his own which is his own power so he's just trying to work in a system that legitimizes his own ability to exert his own power over somebody of person of color and to 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 ignore or silence or erase or whatever the request being made of him by people of color it can always be explained that way okay in fact it's so easy to make stuff up that explains everything that way that you can just do it on the fly Right. Like you, yes, I've, uh, you, you've mentioned to me before, like, it's not actually that hard. Once you get it, you can problematize everything. So you can, you can problematize, problematize anything. anything. It's, it's really, really easy. easy. Well, okay. So let's talk about people of color who disagree though. They're just pawns <laughs> of the patriarchy or, you know, wow. of, like, I, I, like, like what about you, Mike? Yes. Like, <laughs> that's the thing. Like, like it, you, you can't try to usurp a person of color's, Here's what okay, here's a scenario I don't get. So a white like say woke postmodern sorry applied postmodernist would would say maybe argue with someone like you Mike saying why you're wrong. <laughs> if the white person is saying the rhetoric that is the like the woke postmodernist rhetoric against the person of color who disagrees with it, who mm. is right? The white person is perpetuating theory. It's always the person pushing theory that's right. That's the whole thing. Everybody thinks it has to do with skin color, but skin color is secondary. It's that theory can't be wrong is the first and only rule of this game. So they hate, the white they person, hate. They hate when they're when they're victims. Like they hate their victims. The 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 the, the victims that they say that they have, even though they don't, because. Like you, Mike. People of color are politically diverse. So someone like uh, someone like me or Coleman Hughes, it's like this. It's like <laughs> this thing that yeah. doesn't work in there. You're head. problematic. And, uh, you are problematic well, people. Yeah. You yeah. are. Well, but, the problem but we're is, problematic is that... because we're 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 more useful. So the people who aren't fully into this ideology are more likely to listen to say someone like me or or you know less me because I'm I'm kind of a bit light light skinned. But um, 
but I mean, you know, having these intersectional variables and speaking your mind, I think that that is the way you get get through to a lot of people on the edges of this ideology. The that deep people will try and find a way to flip it and and that do this true. kind of mental gym, gymnastics in order to to maintain their ideology. But the people on the outskirts of it who are only kind of half one foot in, one foot out, they're like, oh, hang on a second, that's they get this cognitive dissonance where they have to they have to figure it out. And right. so yeah, we that's I think that the more the more. Uh, yes. from, from these marginalized uh, groups, which, which are like, I, I've i got heaps of black friends my, I, and, and my family. Like, you have black friends. <laughs> hey, hey. Good but for I'm, you. I'm it's not just me, right? Like, I'm not just the one who's trying to, to you know, continue the, the masters, <laughs> the masters, you, you know, I'm not the colonized human that's trying to perpetuate this stuff because, I mean, you hang around like my whole black side of my family are just like they're they're, they're first generation Australians and they're like this is nonsense this is so absolute bullshit mm. um, and so yeah it's 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 funny the, the more the more and the thing is the, fun, the more and more people I speak to that are on this kind of freedom side of it they're, they're all kinds of identities I'm, I'm meeting trans people all sorts of all sorts of people from di- different different walks of life and you know sexual minorities and um disabled and, people what's that disabled people all kinds of disabled people hate this stuff because it's overrunning like real disability services with nonsense mm. right. with political nonsense so wait did you have a comment though jim about the person of color yeah thing yeah what, uh, what were you gonna what, say whiteness is a system anybody can participate in that system whiteness. it's a system of dominance right. whiteness so if, if Mike is doing what Mike is doing, he is actually participating in whiteness because probably it's rewarding him somehow. So mm-hmm. whiteness is a dominant system that has lots of gifts of power, privilege, money, other things that it can bestow upon any grifter who wants to dip into that. So you have these, these people of color who are off script, according to theory. And clearly the reason is because either they have false consciousness, they've been tricked by the system to believe something that's false, like that the system is is good and works for their benefit if they participate in it, or they are cynically trying to exploit that system to their own benefit. You see this a lot in feminism. It's Uncle Tom, it, right? Like that's probably it, yeah, how yeah. people understand this. I'd, I'd be an Uncle Tom. But I mean, if, if an Uncle Tom's the person who... Sometimes I think that, that there are there's a reverse Uncle Tom that kind of buys into this victim narrative. Like it's it's I, I the old media system offered me a lot of benefits. It's insert brown man here or tell me about your victimhood. And and so you you there's there is there's a lot of benefits to 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 playing this game. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. So yes, balls. I would be a real good victim for you. I'm a cry too. And it's kind of like That's a there is good this uncle. Actually, wait, there wait, no, this, we need to ask our actual Tom, Jim. Uncle Tom thing that's going on that on was, their side as well. But I, I want to know what how his, his accent was though, Jim. Oh, oh, that was that was a totally good. Uh, Mike has really good good accents actually. His like, southern accent is pretty good too. I know he's a southern guy here because I'm just Canadian, so I'm like that was a good southern accent, but I don't know. Oh no 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 that was that was not a proper southern accent. That was. <laughs> That was an oppressed Southern accent. <laughs> that, was a, that, was a, that was a horrific you're, you're slave him character that I had. That was a Uncle Tom words. type character. Jim. No, he can do a Texas accent. all sorts of trouble. Okay. Jim, um, white, whiteness, um, is there hope for the, like, in, in this system? <laughs> for us whites. <laughs> yes, because I was like thinking about that girl or, or young, young lady who was, in I think it was around the same time that the boat was being formed, the canoe in your oh, yeah. documentary. She's like, mm. my whiteness. Mm. She like, announced her whiteness. Yeah, yeah. yeah my well, no, this, this is this is something that I think we missed because if you look at the longer section, um, the lo- the longer video, she is First Nations. She is, and so yeah, so she, so she, she's when she's talking about what I will not let whiteness consume me. It's I will not let the history of my people be consumed by by oh, this colonizing force. I thought it's she was less, white. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it's the, it would actually still work if she was. I okay. mean, theoretically, it still works. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, if I okay, but, um, well, I mean, a few, a few people have, have actually mentioned that about her being white, and I was like, oh no, she's there's there's some deep emotional stuff going on with that um with that girl because um 
she talks about her history and things like that. And so um, it's a it's a little bit different, but it, it's still it's a little bit different, but it's very similar. It's 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 a whiteness is a colonizing force, not the force within. It's it's a force without. She, she's talking about. But what? Okay. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's a system. Okay. So it would work even if a white person was saying that because it's a system yeah. and that person could want to reject their participation in that system, but it offers them so many rewards, access to cultural power, et cetera, that they want to, they don't want to let that consume them and let them fall off and just become another perpetuator of white supremacy, whiteness yeah. and, and so racism we're, we're and so all, on. We're all zombies. We're all kind of zombies, like with no agency. We're zombies of the whiteness machine. Is, is of the power of, system. Uh, yeah, it's... Okay. We're, we're, the, we're the NPCs of the of the whiteness machine. That's that's you know how on the reverse they've got this NPC thing. Do you, do you know? Non-person, do you know that non person of color? Non playable character. It's the, oh. the, the kind of, used to describe the old media types who are kind of using. Um, there's no personality, right? It's like it's like kind of this robotic uh, yeah, cliche oh, kind of, delivering yeah. type type old media personality and. Um, and anyway, they call them non-playable characters. They give them shit, whatever. But I think it's it's a good insight into how the other side view view us. So we're non-playable characters of the whiteness machine. We're kind of just perpetuating the systems and the, you know the knowledge, the discourses, and all that sort of thing. We don't know it, but we're just kind of we're like little um, automatons almost. Automatons of this machine, in in a, in a sense, yeah. We don't know it. It's but false consciousness. But I, would I mean, be... it's Sorry. this is really easy to see in religion, though, because it's it's parallel to the concept of sin and depravity that you see in Calvinist Christianity Total almost depravity. perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the idea with depravity is that that you want to sin, essentially, that you're a corrupt individual, you're a corrupt soul that wants to sin, that wants to promote its own interests through sin. Total depravity means that it, it's not like complete and utter, like the maximum amount of depravity. It, it means that it touches every part of your being and experience. So there's no part of, of experience that's not corrupted by the desire to sin. This is the same thing. The whiteness machine is that evil force. It's white privilege is the sin here, or privilege in general is the sin. And so it's people have this kind of depravity state where they want to participate in that system of power because it gives them reward. I mentioned joking that you're working for patriarchal reward, but we put that in our papers, so it's a concept that's real. Or you can talk about neoliberal reward. Neoliberal reward means making money. Money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Patriarchal the papers, reward was, would be like, was, like if uh, was, guys were calling the neoliberal reward in place of money. I don't know why that was so funny to me. Yeah, it's like several, working for several neoliberal times. reward. They're working for money. Just say money. No, 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 neoliberal reward. We don't want to say capital. That means money. Okay. Yeah, that's what it means. And so patriarchal reward would be that uh, you're going to get positive attention and promotion by men in the patriarchy. So, you know, you're a cute girl. You do you cute things and boom, we're going to promote you and give you more credit than you deserve. Yeah, that's Yeah. In the patriarchy. Girl. Right. Yeah. And so there's uh, all of the, these systems of privilege also provide access to reward. And so there's a lot of seduction, just like you'd have the seduction to sin, to, to be selfish or enjoy yourself or put your own interests ahead of other things, the church in particular, mm-hmm. or uh, following God or whatever it's supposed to be. Just like you'd have the seduction within the, the religious view to do that. If you are outside of that there's the there's the, there's a seduction to want to cash in on it so you can try to be you know you can try to cash in on neoliberal reward by by trying to make money or you know selling yourself as a grifter you can try to cash in on um patriarchal reward by trying to get men's attention or get men to promote you you can try to cash in on the the rewards of a white supremacist society by uh throwing your races under the bus um, in order to participate in whiteness. And so there's a seduction to want to participate. If you have privilege to uh, to participate in that, and then if you're outside of that, uh, that privilege status to try to cash in on it by, you know, telling black people to pull up their pants or whatever it happened to be. That was a huge thing when I was a teenager was you had this kind of group of, of black men who are prominent in the community telling other black men to pull up their pants and get off drugs and people are really mad about it and I never understood what's going on. At least in this applied postmodern sense, I understand that they were um, 
essentially trying to say participate in whiteness. Would it be believed? Is it? Do you believe or or subscribe to the theory? Which would do the, the proper wording? Like, would I believe it or subscribe to the theory of postmodern uh, applied postmodernism? Um, I don't know that they actually uh, look at it quite like that. They look at theory as a as a lens or a set of lenses by which the world can be viewed and so they see this not as a set of beliefs but as a set of um of of, of understanding or knowledge that's why they'll always tell you that if you don't understand you need to get educated and they've taken over colleges to educate people into uh seeing things through an interpretive frame of theory so they the they see you if you don't accept it as being kind of uh, uneducated or uncouth or something like that, rather than um, it being a set of beliefs that you subscribe to. That's kind of one of the things I would like to achieve over the next year or two, and probably a lot with Mike's help, is to start communicating that this really is a very close to a, a doctrinal belief system. And so when people start coming in and they're saying things like check your privilege and all of this, they're actually talking about a set of very religious beliefs um, that are being passed off as though they are, are knowledge claims or established knowledge about sociology or how the world works. Right. And that's what that's why we did the project was to target that scholarship and show that it's actually not on any firmer ground than anything else that just gets pushed through by some agenda other than, than the rigor. other thing that I, the way I think that this works in, in the wild, because there's, there's the, um, university kind of codified church system that's going on and it's operating in the wild in a different way. I think that the people who, who, who understand these, these kind of very densely theoretical ideas, they, they produce art and tweets and memes and, and, you know, like it, it more, more simple to consume versions of the, these very, very uh, complicated um, philosophical groundwork that's happening in the academy. And if you're a person who, who, who is leaning towards that, that anyway and you consume enough of these ideas, there's, there's, embedded, there's embedded philosophy in these ideas. So if you take this idea as true, you're actually taking these other like metaphysical assumptions along with it. And if you, if you consume enough of that, all of a sudden the, the, the underlying principles of the philosophy, they kind of re, re-establish themselves through these, this meme level that's going on. Can you and give so, an example well, of a this, meme that, that you might have in mind? Um, uh, well, I, th- I can see a lot of them happening around uh, sy- systemic racism. So there's this there's this guy Amon Rahman here in it was the first time I, I I saw this this redefinition of racism and thought that's really he sold it really really well he's got this bit that went viral he's, he's a comedian about um, about racism about um, about racism I'm I'm going to butcher it but but underneath it it was it was a com- comedy bit about how. White, black people can't be racist. It's only just white people. And so it's, it, this, this stuff has been codified in the universities. It's, it, there's a very, very complex set of ideas mm-hmm. that have led to this kind of easily consumable bit. And this thing went viral and everyone's like, yeah, this makes me feel like this is, this is, there's, this, there's this moral consolidation of, of, of their, their worldview in, in this thing. So it's gone viral and they're sharing it and they're like, this is how I see the world, this is how I think. And so if you consume enough of this, this, popular, this popular stuff, you'll see it in tweets. Tweet, tweets are like one or two sentences uh, that, that are like little, little meme versions of these, these, bigger, these bigger, more um, well, well-established philosophies. Okay. Feminist so comics, some man. Got, some people could 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 actually know a lot about the work, you know, this epistemic exploitation and all that sort of thing. They can they could know a lot about that from just little conversations and tweets and and comedy bits and things like that. They can actually slowly consume enough of this stuff and then and then embody the, the philosophy. Okay. Cause, um, okay. Sorry, Jim. No, it's just that's, I think, correct. I don't think most people study the theory and they're learning some, some of the people are learning some of it in college. The diversity requirement courses are a little bit more concerning. It's probably getting shuttled into more people that way. Um, 
from what I've read, I've heard some people say that most college students seem to be, you know, some accept it and some reject it. And I don't want to say most do anything, but I'm seeing more and more saying that, you know, it's, it's very broadly accepted as though it's true. And I think it's, Mostly, though, what Mike is saying, it's like you go watch something that's cool for teenage girls or for, you know, any any particular demographic group. And it's just just eaten through with this. Go watch Samantha B. <laughs> go watch her, her her little routine on her show for 20 minutes. And just your jaw just hangs open about how many of these memes she's thrown out. Um, I see feminist comics all the time where it'll be some like little jibe about patriarchy or whatever, or some need to be intersectional tossed in there. And it's like, I don't even understand how this is supposed to be entertaining or whatever. So it's kind of everywhere. And I think a lot of people consume it, like Mike was saying, at the ground level without engaging directly with the theory. And they pick up a lot of how it's supposed to work, but they don't articulate it that way. And as far as, you know, you said the word belief, it wasn't totally fair there because I remembered while Mike was talking that uh, I get asked routinely when I start talking about this stuff, do you believe in privilege? Do you believe there's privilege? Do you believe white privilege exists? And wait, you believe white privilege exists though, right? And so it's there, there's definitely people recognizing on some level that there's that this is operating at a level of belief. Um, but, you know, I also hear you believe evolution, so... Well, because um, I... I know, because I've actually gotten a lot of uh, flack for saying... I, I recently... I think I, maybe you gave me flack. I don't know. I said I believe in evolution. Like, like the past... It's been about two years. I didn't give you flack You didn't. It, okay, you just... Okay. I didn't. I've talked to I'm you not, about I it, but I'm... Oh, no, I've, I've checked my much. language be, by the time I spoke with you because I had enough people on Twitter... You don't believe... Actually, Benjamin Boyce is like, you don't just believe in evolution. You, it's uh, you it's just true. You know, but like, it's just a fact, you know. But, but this, is, this is an interesting thing. And I think maybe the postmodernists do have a point here is you haven't read all the papers on evolution. You haven't like done all that homework yourself. So there's an element of belief there. Like I haven't... Sure. Do you know what I mean? Like you, it, sure. it is, it is belief. Well, like I, I, I don't want to this is know, where give the us a pass because we, we've got our own little in group. But so, um, so this uh, is, yeah, this is the idea laundering thing, right? So if you trace back, you know, you haven't read all those papers, you haven't read all those books, but if you trace back, you can go back and in the scientific record, there's a thing where you know people have actually figured this out, and we consider that to be rigorous knowledge production, and everybody essentially agrees on that, with, except for a handful of uh, creationists. However, if you, and I have had many conversations uh, with Christian people, Glenn Beck among them, who say at the end of the day, you go back, and then there's faith, and so they 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 say that the chain of their beliefs, they know that you know whatever religious precept mm -hmm. is true mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this, because this, because this, and it goes back, and then instead of it being and then there was this rigorous observation that was carefully tested, blah, blah, blah. It was because I have faith. And so there's this recognition there. Now, with the applied postmodernists, they say, well, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. And you go back, there's a paper, there's a study. Kringerly Crenshaw got published, blah, 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 mapping the margins. And so it's all in the same, same academic canon that from, unless you're very into the inside baseball of academia, looks like the scientific record. Because yeah, and some papers. of it is the same. I mean, you've described my experience of this as well, because it's like I'm I'm in in seeing all these memes and and you know this language being spoken. I'm like, this doesn't sound right. Um, before I take this on, because I you know I've I've got that those social justice leanings. It's 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 you know it's the moral orthodoxy now, and I was kind of it's it plays to my moral sensibilities. And so I was like, well, before I take this on, let's let's see where it goes. And you follow it, and you follow it, and you follow it, and then you get to the end, and you're like, oh. <laughs> it's theology oh um, it's theology yeah it's belief it doesn't you know what i mean it's like oh so this is this is th th this is a new religion this isn't this isn't science as they're claiming it to be and so you know there, there, there could there could be a lot of value in some of the ideas connected to this stuff but we i think the people this is what i want my film to show is that um as long as people understand that, as long as people like this, they're, they're pretending to be something they're not. And, and that to me, that's, that's some kind of corruption. As Can long as people understand that? where pretending? stuff is coming from. Can you explain well, they're the They're pretending pretending? to be social scientists. They're pretending to use the scientific method. 
and um, and and these 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 ideas and everything are coming from a from a very rigorous place. But it's it's so far removed from anything that can be considered rigorous uh, that. They're taking the respect that we as a culture afford to science and the scientific method and using it for their own gain. It's like, it's like I mean, if uh, there's a lot of fundamentalist Christians or, or you know, uh, jihadis that would love this kind of, this respect paid to their, to their, uh, their, their text. Mm. Um, and if they could do this, they would. <laughs> and so it's, it's a new group that's bubbled up through the university and is using, is using what, the respect that the Enlightenment has gained, and all, all the all the, the the outcomes that it's delivered, and the trust that we have as a people in that method and in 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 the academy to do something that's closer to uh, theology, or you know something something that's not quite um, yeah. rigorous. What, what do you what, what do you think about that, Jim? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that's that's the the long and short of the intellectual side of it. They're doing the same thing morally too. They're usurping the moral authority of the civil rights movements and claiming that their methods were what were effectual in in you know achieving all of these great gains. Uh, being disruptive is what was necessary. And there, there's again kernels of truth to these things. So they're they're they're, they're laundering the idea. That the academic respectability is there. They're laundering the idea that they have the the right side of history, uh, moral authority behind them, and, and just kind of like usurping it to their their cause, where where none of that is supported, even on kind of you know modest scrutiny. Uh, so I, yeah, I think you described it really well, actually, Mike. Uh, as far as the intellectual side, I'm actually very concerned with the with the moral side as well. That they they claim this moral authority that used a different method that was primarily the. I mean, there were disruptive things certainly going on, and they certainly yeah. made use of use of parody and other other elements. But certainly, they were not dividing up society into these you know, system of awful power structures that are in kind of zero-sum competition with one another and, and very essential. They were instead, you know, the civil rights movement and the Gary's movement were appealing to the, the liberal contract of our society that if everybody is equal, then that should be owned up to. We should actually act like everybody was, was created equal in our society and we should treat them and give equal rights and equal treatment before the law and within society. And so, so then, we're talking about, yeah, talk about Mandela and, and, uh, and, um, and, and uh, Martin Luther King and so yeah, all, yeah. all the people, that, all these figures that we, we love you know, we, we revere these people who have done all this really good work for, for actual social justice um, their philosophy was completely different to what these guys were pushing. And so it's, it's, how, how dare you take, take their name to do what you're, you're currently trying to do? It's, there's this branding of, like, of, of the civil rights movements, and there's this cool branding. It's like the Black Panthers, and you know, they're, 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 they're doing all this subversive stuff. Um, whether that's warranted in our current level of you know civil rights like it's all it's all it's not there, there's systemic problems we've got to fix but I, I don't i don't think we should be blowing up power stations do you know what i mean but there's there's this branding that there was actually and there was some really subversive stuff that was going on back back in those times and we look at it and we say these, these guys are cool these guys were, were, were against the man and they're, they're trying to be that now in a time where it's not as warranted um, and they're doing it in different terms. So they're using that branding to get away with this authoritarian way of, of doing, doing what they're doing. And what, what is, Lisa, this brings me back to what does this mean? But actually, before I go over to that, I want to say, like, what is their, what's the goal? And I think you guys, one of you mentioned it, but I don't remember what it was. What's the goal of all, if all of us white individuals were, I guess, as the white partakers in Evergreen being like, you tell me where to go, I'll do it. You tell me when to speak, I'll do it. Say, say like, even though this is all totalitarian and would never actually happen again unless it was, you know, communist Russia and whatever. Like, in that sort of a structure, we all do that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
Mike command us, right? Like, <laughs> for me and Jim, right? Like, so, yeah. oh, but wait, I'm a woman. So, like, I'm in between. Like, yeah, so, yeah. so, so we, we've, we have our numbers of who we defer to and what the structure has been created. What is, what does that look like? What is the goal? Like, what is that life? I mean, I mean, if it, it developed, developed, it would probably look something close to a caste system, system I would have thought. There's lots of uh, cultures that have, have caste systems and try to put people into into hierarchies based on some kind of you know moral or belief system. Um, it, it, it's, very, it's fundamentally destructive from what I look like, from what I can see. It doesn't look like it can move toward anything. And you, you see these things, you see, I mean, it's... It, it, there's a lot of it documented. Like you can look, you can look through YouTube, and you just you see it, see it work. Especially, I think the best, the best documentation of it has been Evergreen in my in my mind. And you can see, you can see it playing out. It's playing out in a rough kind of activist way. So, but it's um, it seems like you never land in some kind of you know anarchy with uh, with anarchy plus caste system. But who knows? What do you think about this, Jim? You're probably better. Uh, I would say that that's probably close to the true answer, but the right answer is that they're going for equity, and that is equity measured across history. So oh, equity, as in you get, we make up for past sins. Yes. So yeah, yeah. The, the right answer is that binaries will be undone. Society will be inclusive and no one will ever insult anyone ever again or make them feel excluded or not participatory. And meanwhile, the systems in society will be such that populational parity, but as considered historically, will be achieved. So, for example, we've had however many hundred years in the United States of mostly male Supreme Court justices. And so if you look at the total number of male and the total number of female until the number of male and female over all of American history comes out to 50-50, there wouldn't be gender parity on the Supreme Court, for example. Or if you look at it with race until you go over all the history, the number of black people has to be whatever the proportion of the United States population is. That's the kind of thing that they're claiming. So you've described it from the inside. I've just described from what I, I can yeah. see. What I so, can see heading a, uh, yeah, I think you gave the true answer and I gave the right answer. Well, this sort of the epistemological, <laughs> yeah, the theory answer, yeah. I mean, the, the thing, thing that they're aiming for... Of the world view, um, yeah, the, the thing that they're aiming for is equity, and they measure equity with what appear to be moving goalposts uh, such that there's uh, historical injustices being made up for. Certainly what they would want to do on a practical level would be to um, get rid of any kind of systemic or uh, direct unfairness, as they would see it, or discrimination. So you would have zero sexual harassment by, like, the absolutely most sensitive sexual harassment definition that you can imagine. And you would have zero racial insensitivity or discrimination by the most sensitive measurement that you can possibly imagine. And so that's why this is eventually going to follow a path like what Mike says, is because there's no actual way to satisfy the demands of the people who are, are pushing for it, because whatever happens... And, then, and there's, also no, there's also no way to uh, be the arbiter between, arbitrate between um, uh, legitimate grievances, even even in there, and, and the grifting grievances. There's, just, there's no way to do that, because, you, because you're only deferring... The two? What's the difference between that? Well, well you can see this in... Um, in Evergreen, I think that it's cool part of the case study because um, because you, you're not you're not a, you're not you don't have an objective point that you can both outside of both of your experiences to refer to to find the truth. You, it's just it's just a your experience versus their experience type thing. And so what what you're going to have as a result of over respect of someone's experience is people who are cynical, who are grifting that and telling you they're having an experience when they're not. And so you can see this in, um, and there's no way, there's no way because within this philosophy, all the ways to um, find truth between you have been dismantled. 
So you'll see this in, in Evergreen is, you know, maybe some of these kids are having, um, you know, they're scared and all this sort of, sort of thing. And, you know, maybe there was a few, uh, you know, racially insensitive things going on. But there'd be no way to tell between that and the girl who's, who's saying, hey, I want free meals and... Um, and uh, more time on an exam you know, or something. More time on an exam, all this sort of thing. There's just there's no because because you have to respect their experience no matter what. There's there's no there's no real way out. So there's no real there's no judge. There's no there's no third party. Uh, you know, referee, which which we in um, in our current society we have systems in place where there's a third party referee and systems to refer to to go, oh, no, well, sorry, I was wrong about this. It's kind of cutting that out, and we're living inside this experience world. Yeah, there's a consequence of that from within critical race theory where you would actually never say that the uh, project was done. The activism had succeeded because one of the tenets of critical race theory is to say that uh, opportunities, say that activists' demands are all met, one of the claims that they can make is that the only reason the white system met their demands was to make itself look good. Therefore, more dismantling of the system is necessary. And again, you can't distinguish between that being done legitimately and that being done as a, as a grifting power grab. Right. Uh, because it's it's cooked into the thing that, and this is actually a tenet of critical race theory. I'm not exaggerating this. Look it up on Wikipedia for all I care. Uh, it is that when advances are made for, in particular with this black rights or black opportunity or, or equity for blacks or whatever, that if a white system gave it to them, it was to make, the white system did it to make itself look good. And there's absolutely no way to arbitrate that. There's no way to determine if that's true. And so in that sense, you know, they achieve all of their objectives and then they would be able to come back and claim, oh, well, we only achieved our objectives because it suited the white patriarchy or whatever to, to, to give us this. Therefore, we still have to continue the work and it's not equal yet. And so there, there's really this is why when it's put into practice, you know, like things that are claiming sound very good, inclusion, equity and so on, even if. Even if you understand their definitions, they don't sound, they're bad, but they don't sound horrible. Mm -hmm. But then once once you get to like how this gets put into practice and how they built up their, as, as many people refer to them, Kafka traps, and how they, you know, have this whole idea that, that every, the whole system is geared to always work against them and perpetuate itself. You see why it's going to go to the kind of almost Lord of the Flies, you know, internal collapse that, that Mike was describing, the, the caste system. That's, that's managed with anarchy. Um, well, it, it just sounds so hopeless. Like the way, like, like I'm just, again, I'm imagining from my own perspective, I would just feel horrible all the time because my first nature as a white lady would be to perpetuate whatever white narrative and I, like, I would probably just feel bad. Like I, you know, oh, and they do, they do. It's right. like this. Uh, it's like this. There's this gender numb thing that's going on with this self-flagellation. Like when I first started looking in this, um, I mean, Alison Bailey is probably the best person who embodies this. You look at her and she's just like tired and oh, I hate myself. And she's like flagellating in front of these these this black audience. And I was watching this thing with her, and even at the end, there's this black guy on. You're all right. Like, take it easy. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to hurt yourself so much. But, but um, then couldn't they problematize that to by being like, you're just looking to get sympathy with your yeah, white with your white it. girl tears, right? Hey, and they're, 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 this, this is where the, this is where the torture comes. You know, this is where the torture. You can't do anything up. right. Like, like, I think that when you brought it up as a religion, Jim, like my however many months ago your article came out, it just clicked. And there's no atonement. There's mm. no salvation. You, you're, you're, it's, it's just, can I buy another indulgency, please? please? Yeah, yeah. May, yeah. Oh, I'm, oh, my last one ran out. May I buy another indulgence? Like, it, it reminds me, sorry, uh, Christian history is my, um, my specialty in, from school. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what it reminds me of is the Catholic Church, they need some money to build St. Peter's Basilica. So let's oh, wow. up the, the selling of the indulgencies. Let's start. Jim, should, I, should I drop that, that weird thing I was telling you the other day? Because I think that we're going to find some true denominations. It's very interesting um, that, that you said that because I'm, I'm having this thought that um, 
So what what is so let, let's go back to pre pre modern times, pre Enlightenment. What is the Catholic Church? It's 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 the codified truth. So you've got all these middlemen between the truth and the people who are accepting truth on the other side of that, right? And so you've got this. You know, it's 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 good in a way. It serves a purpose because it's um you know you've got some kind of distribution network for the truth, the cornerstone of reality. Um, but it leaves itself open to being uh, corrupted. Mm-hmm. Um, then all of a sudden you've got Luther comes along um, and he goes, no, this, this is corrupted, this is corrupted. Let's, and he's got his, his mate, the printing press. And so he's like, well, well, you know what? Everyone have the truth. Everyone take the truth. And, uh, and so all of a sudden this, this church that was there, this kind of middleman between the truth and the people, it started, it started crumbling um, to an extent. And all these, all these uh, kind of uh, Protestant denominations came up with their own, with their own interpretation of the truth. And when we disagree, um, we'll just split, and then we'll keep splitting and splitting. And then, so what, what do we have in, after the Enlightenment? We've got the university, and we've got data becomes the truth. It's not the word of God anymore. It's, the, it's data. Mm-hmm. And so you've got middlemen between the truth. Um, and and the, the oh, data the, and studies and the, the process. new system, and yeah. It's the new system. It's like it's like Spinoza's God is the new God, really. It's the God of, of modes that we can learn. And so you've got all these uh, middlemen between that, but because you've got the middlemen, it's open to corruption. And so we're in this we're in this corner of the um, the academy that is using using the, the trust that we have in that institution for their own means, which is you know selling indulgences. All of a sudden, you have the internet, and Ma- you know Maggie Peterson is is this is this uh, is Luther. this Luther character. <laughs> it's, you know, because it's Luther and all these other people. Maybe it's the intellectual dark web. Yeah. Plus, they made the internet, which gives gives the we can go straight to the data. We we got, we got the Bible ourselves, so we're going to have all these interpretations of the truth. Like we do Protestant denominations. Yeah. Um, and so we're going. I think we're going to have truth denominations now. So anyway, this is this is what I. I, I like I, that. I just think it's funny that you brought up Peterson as the delineator of truth, because. Oh no, no no no! Sorry sorry! sorry. I gotta I gotta, I gotta correct that. Oh, it's okay. just, it's, he's the guy. He's the guy who. Because I mean, uh, Luther, Luther's just going, "Hey, these guys are talking shit over here in the in the church." Okay, okay. okay. And otherwise, look at this, and so. The, the, you know, there, there was, it wasn't just Luther, there was heaps of people, right? There was heaps of people at the time. Luther's yeah. the guy that we give, he was the most famous guy. Yes. No, but it was, it, was him and, it was him and his mate, the, the, uh, the, the printing press. So it's probably the printing press, but we, we, we go, like, Luther did that. Um, and so may, maybe, I don't know, in a hundred years, we're going to have the character that did the Luther thing. And I, I suspect Peterson's so famous, it's probably going to be given him. I think that he could advance his understanding of the situation a lot. Helen's done all the homework that he right. needs. He needs in his in his kind of you know cohesive philosophy that he's developing. Well, he was he the needs, first. He needs it. They need to sit down for three hours, or you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll do. Oh, maybe I'll do one of these. Book. That I'll, cool. I'll facilitate one of these. I'm sure that they'll just love. They'll just love. <laughs> but, like, but, but but he was the first I heard tell of postmodernism, as applied. I guess, and then through uh, the the Grievance Studies initiative, I guess we'll say, we haven't even talked about exactly what it is. We talked about the Evergreen um, documentary on your end, and yes, this is kind of all an intro yeah, talk. talk. Too, yeah, I'll I'll too. add it in the end intro. I'll try to I'll try to yeah, articulate okay. it. But Jim, with regards to your Grievance Studies, um, yeah, yeah, like sort of. Uh, I said initiative. I don't know. I think of the Dharma initiative from Lost. I don't know. So, yeah. But like, so, so the, your, your project, I guess. So uh-huh. what, why did you start it in the first place? That's a complicated question, actually. But the long and short of it was that we, Peter and I particularly, uh, with Helen kind of tangential to that and agreeing, but not at the same kind of place that Peter and I were, had come to the conclusion that they were, uh, Peter in particular at that point, believed that they couldn't tell just absolute nonsense from what they were doing. And I kind of suspected that might be the case, but I wasn't so sure. How did he and, even think this, though? Like, how did he even... Oh, go... We were looking at that 
Twitter feed new peer uh, new real peer review and seeing the kinds of papers that were coming out and some of these uh, these journals that uh, feminist uh, geography journal, for example, that we ended up getting the dog park paper. Oh, the glaciology is a, paper, right? The feminist glaciology paper was a really big one for us, and so we were like, "This stuff's so crazy. You could probably just write anything that smashes down on men and complains about white people enough and get it in, as long as it's you know kind of the stuff they would write and just fill in some some citations and it would fly." And we we, we figured out pretty quick that that actually doesn't work. Uh, but that's actually how we started was to see if it was actually that broken. Mm. Then we, at that point, we were in trouble. Helen was already helping us, and we were like, oh, no, that, that didn't work. We were wrong about that. What do we do? And so then we said, well, let's just learn what's going on and just try to make this work. And so with Helen's help as primarily, you know, my tutor, and she was researching it herself and uh, right, helping us write things and fleshing out what we had done and helping us edit what we were, were, we were doing. We started to actually learn what was going on in this applied postmodern scholarship. And then at that point, the goal had become not to show that they can't tell nonsense from what they consider to be scholarship, but rather to demonstrate that we understand their scholarship well enough to reproduce it, and that it's so out there that you can publish absolute absurdities or irresponsible uses of data or bad interpretation or questionable is a nice word, ethics, and pass it off in their scholarship. So they're kind of you know, there's two things going on there. Can we prove that we understand this by getting papers published? And can we write these papers in ways so that, at least from our own perspective, it's undeniable how they fail in some domain of scholarship or ethics? And, and the answer has turned out to be yes, we can understand it. They proved for us that we understand it by publishing our papers. And then that we... Um, we're able to say that whatever's going on there, you really can get some pretty crazy absurdities or uh, ethically questionable conclusions uh, accepted as though they're great ideas. So I'm thinking of the putting the white kids or white guys <laughs> in chains and just having them yeah, sit on the floor. All the floor? Yeah. So, so is it just white guys or is it white people? Well, the we were pretty ambiguous about that, but it was primarily meant to be that white men would be invited to, to listen and learn in silence. But any white people at all who wanted to experience reparations would be invited to sit on the floor, possibly wearing light chains as a means of experiencing reparations to expand the set of shared epistemic resources of the classroom and overcome Christy Dodson's irreducible epistemic oppression. Okay. So, so I, I, have, I have in mind, like, you know, just like swing set chains, like just light not too, yeah, not yeah. too heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just representational yeah. chains, but right. chains nonetheless. Yeah, was, yeah, the idea was was to so there's this idea called progressive stacking that takes people who are supposed to be of oppression status and it puts them first, so they get to speak first they, if they want to, they get to speak longest if they want to. They're heard out first. This came from Occupy Wall Street, where real activists put it to use. And somebody in 2017 tried to put it in our class in Pennsylvania and got in trouble for it. So we were like, let's just write a paper saying it's a great idea. <laughs> Submit it to one of the best journals and see what they do with it. And they loved it. Yeah, and they loved um, it. They didn't publish it though. Um, oh. We didn't get that. We didn't get that far with that paper. Uh, okay. So at, at any rate, um, we thought it was one thing just to write it up, but it'd be another thing to flip it. And not just do we give oppressed people extra privileges, but we have to punish people who are, are considered privileged uh, or invite them to punish themselves, really. And right, invite. That, you don't want to be invite. Yeah, literally forcing so right. it's got to be chosen right right yeah it's an educational opportunity is what we said oh, and so oh that sounds yeah. great yeah there's a lot of euphemisms going on here um so yeah that was that was the idea behind that paper and the reviewers were quite warm to the project they 
introduced me to one of the scariest things that I'm aware of in their feedback to us. They told us because we said, it, oh, wow, well, they won't take this. So we have to be compassionate. And so we wrote up all the stuff about, oh, well, we'll do it. We'll put him in chains. We'll do it compassionately. We'll talk over him, but we'll do it compassionately. And they were like, no, that recenters the needs of the privileged. And you need to use Megan Bowler's pedagogy of discomfort, which is the horrifying thing. And so there's this idea that the only way that you can learn to overcome your privilege is by being forced to confront it and then sit with that discomfort. I keep talking about my expertise before I got into this was in the psychology of religion. And I kept talking about the way that conversion experiences, especially in religions like Jehovah's Witnesses or Scientology or whatever, these ones are more cultish or more outright cults, uh, are often affected, very charismatic uh, strains of like Pentecostal Christianity do this too, by manufacturing and manipulating vulnerability. This is a well-documented means to affect a religious conversion. So you give somebody an emotional and cognitive state of dissonance, make them very uncomfortable, make them feel vulnerable and guilty, and then you give them the pathway out. The smarmy pastor archetype of this, you know, have you ever told a lie? What do you call somebody who lies? Do you know that if you ask Jesus Christ for forgiveness for that sin right now, that you can be forgiven and go to heaven? You know, you give them, you make them uncomfortable and you give them the pathway out. Mm. And so when you talk about the pedagogy of discomfort, this is literally saying our educational system should be working to overcome privilege. And the way that we do it is by manufacturing vulnerability, by making somebody uncomfortable and force them to sit in that discomfort. Meanwhile, we instruct them that recognizing and trying to fight against their, their privilege is the way out of that feeling of vulnerability. Uh, and, and so this is actually a mechanism. Robert D'Angelo all over. And there's, um, in Evergreen, if you look at the source material I was using, we have to sit with this uncomfortability. And it's, uh, they're, they're, they're often telling people that, yes, this is uncomfortable. Let's, let's, let's sit here and let's, let's, let's think about this and let's work with the um, uncomfortability. I don't know why they use that word, but uh, it, 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 it pops up. Quite a few, quite a few times. Yeah, all of these sort of like critical race and education people really are invested in this idea that you have to make privileged people uncomfortable, which is to say to make them feel vulnerable, and then you instruct them that subscribing to and promoting the ideology is the pathway out of their discomfort. This is how you affect a religious or occult conversion. It's, I mean, this is well understood psychology. It's it, it, it sounds it sounds like a sort of manuf a, a pseudo salvation but it doesn't stay so you have to keep on looking for that pathway out in the midst of when you're repeatedly made to feel uncomfortable and vulnerable oh, and yeah. sit right like like more yeah, in your sin totally more in your sin that's how it sounds to me it's the psychology of an abuser it is absolutely the psychology of an abuser they do the whole thing on their gaslighting and it's a whole thing it's super abusive um it comes with a smile, though. It comes with a smile and a hug, which is the weird thing. Is that when you when you can detach from the emotional stuff that's going on in the room, and you can really look at it. You're like, you can realize there's this darker underbelly to it. But what was um, the word Pete used about their emails, all their communications as they come to you? So was it saccharin? They're yeah, so saccharin, saccharin sweet. sweetly sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, it's a smile. <laughs> it's 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 like a it's like a loved one that's abusing you. Yeah, it's like they're sticking you in the ribs with a dagger and they're smiling and telling you it's all right or that they love you or whatever. Well, it, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I could almost sleep, imagine... Sleep. Did you guys, for your own good. Well, yeah, did you yeah. guys do like any papers where where there was a literal sort of where the maybe the people of color would give lashes to like white people for... We, can't, we didn't go that I don't far. Know, well, but like, you can't, you can't, you, there's a certain spot where you can't go further. Okay, like it, it can happen. That seems... kind of, it's kind of things can happen in the wild, but within the, yeah. within the academic system, there's only so, so much you can, there's only so far you can take it and, and you okay. have to really couch it in, in, in these terms and, and, and be careful because they, they, they're still professionals. They're, um, they're, they're, they're not kind of mad that they, they have a brand they have to keep and okay, right. um and they they have to they have to be able to operate within the academic system and you know the bureaucracy has to look after them they they can't they can't go past a certain point but then right. then if you if you look about if you look at the, i mean some of the talks during the coming together series she was she was there's a there's a, and was an a more activist 
academic who was who was like advocating for throwing bottles at police and things like that. And so it does get wilder. It does get wilder, okay. but it wouldn't get, it wouldn't get that wild in in the text because there's some kind of record and there's there's a because um, I, okay because I thought of the change. Yeah, a lot of our ideas. Sorry. A lot of our ideas got shut down. We had this activist versus academic split, and a lot of them got shut down as being too activist in nature. And Helen was kind of the police officer there. No, no, that's definitely what the activist would say, and no academic would write that. It's not consistent with theory explicitly. Did the, and it was this very, like, you have to be really careful where the line between activism and, and uh, academics would be. And Helen was, like... She really killed some of our funnier ideas with that. Okay, wait, wait, like what? <laughs> Total like, I want to hear the. I want to hear. It. Oh, I don't have any straight to mind on that okay. exactly. That would have been activist ideas, but there, anything that was like really nasty, the idea of like lashing people or okay. something like that would definitely fall under that rubric. But see how, see, but see how, like you, you mentioned light chains. So to me, I'm like, oh, okay, so. Let's let's do some lashes. Let's give it a go. Lashes. Why right? not? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, the it why not like thing, it. right? That sounds okay. Why not? And then yeah. you you after thirty why nots, you're you're a, you're a different person, <laughs> right? But then right. So so but that's in the wild, and that's the thing is, I guess that's where Evergreen comes in, in the midst of the grievance study affair. Is it's the result of the epistemology, it seems. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm trying Trying to institutionalize it as well. It's a closed system that's uh, that's genuine. Had a genuine attempt to institutionalize it. So the structures of power said okay. <laughs> okay, because, then, but why would they say then, okay there, but not say to? Well, we'll give the example of like say the 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 lashing. Like why would it maybe be said okay there? Versus in the academy, there's just a number oh, of steps. These are different things. Like the lashing is a specific instance, okay, uh, or you yeah, know, within the, within the codified kind of scholarship. Yeah. Whereas what, what they, they were saying, okay, to um, bring them in and just adjust the them. Ideas. They were saying okay to the, the structural structural philosophical ideas, and the the, the, the kids were the ones who who were um, like playing them out. Who, yeah, who were playing them yeah. out. Yeah. Playing out I mean, the, the inevitable consequence in my in my estimation. Yeah. So I mean, you had that scene where it had to happen within the structure that's available. So you have that scene where Bridges is is convinced that the science and the STEM faculty is the problem, a particular problem, and so he's. He agrees with what the kids tell him is uh, the young adults, I guess, tell him is, you know, bring them in. We're going to adjust them. And if it doesn't take, take, we'll sanction them. Well, professional sanction is the equivalent here of lashes. I mean, it's not physical, physical abuse, but it's right. it's it's like within that system. That's the thing. And so when it when it gets loose in the wild or if you couch it in the right terms, you probably could get away with that. We were actually trying to at one point write a paper that was going to talk about institutionalized and we ran out of time and, we, and bailed out on it is why it didn't get finished institutionalizing inquisitions in workplaces uh so it'd be like you know if you get summoned before the diversity office and and then you know they call a character witness in so you go to bat for your friend and say no i've never seen him act that way or whatever now you have to get diversity training because you know uh, you stood up for somebody who had been accused. And so we were going to write a paper saying that that was proper professional conduct and HR conduct. Um, and, but we just never got far enough. So, so yeah, well, with, I mean, the, the, the recommendations in this, in the, the crazier end of this stuff is pushing further and further and further and further and trying to get, trying, trying to push towards something that's scary, really. Like, right. Um, but but it but it has to do it has to do it an inch at a time because he can't just go hey let's send people to re readjustment camps. Mm, <laughs> um, I know it's, it's slower than that. Like you have to it has to work within something that sounds reasonable, and it, it has to be the why not why not why not why not. Oh, and then, and you then know, the, you, the, the all of a sudden why not your uh, right your you know I mean you know yeah people have said why not one step it away in history and things that, and you've why not you yourself off a cliff yeah. right mike i actually don't know how you heard about uh helen and and peter and, and jim like how did you get involved in the first place so i i mean I, I mentioned earlier in the conversation about how i was looking at this stuff i was you know chasing the terminology upstream to the academy and a lot of a lot of my friends knew that i was doing this and trying to look for a film in it because it looked like um 
I was doing this because I just wanted to figure it out, but also I'm always looking for a film. So it was like this landscape is where the film is. I don't know if it's in the activist or if it's in the academy. I'm just talking to people. I was talking to people all over the world um, and going to lots of um, universities and speaking to people and trying to figure this thing out. And a friend, uh, Pete and I have a, have a mutual friend, mm. and Pete was talking to them about this um, this stuff and he was like well you've got to get in contact with mike mike's looking into this stuff so we we met through through that mutual friend and then pete told me about the uh the project so it was before jim and pete had started writing and helen's helen's involvement was very distant at that point Mm -hmm. um because she became more and more involved um over the course of the project Mm -hmm. so yeah and then uh, it was I, w- I wasn't sure what to think about Jim and Pete to start. Initially, it was, um, I-, I thought, especially Pete, like he-, he shoots from the hip, he's this kind of brash guy. So I was getting a massive used car salesman vibe from him. Like he- <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Pete, his heart, he's got a heart of gold, but when you first meet him, a lot of people are like, what the hell's going on here? Because he's just he's big and <laughs> he's energetic. And, okay. and he, was, he, he was confident. He was confident in, in how many um, – he was too confident uh, mm. in how many papers they could land. And mm. it seemed to me like he was disres- there was a level of disrespect to the um, – how could you say it? It's, I wouldn't say enemy, but adversary. Like it's, it was, it was, it was, I think it seemed to me like he was underestimating what he was going up against. And so in the back of my head, I'm like, this is strange. And this is, this is very, it speaks a lot to what I'm looking at. So, and there's characters, like these guys seem like yeah, big characters. characters, interesting humans. Okay. And so I'm like, well, there's a film here, but I was slightly concerned that they would fail. Mm. And then, I would have to. I, I would spend all this time, yeah, uh, you know, filming stuff and hanging out with them, and then not have anything. So, so initially, the deal was, I was like, okay, there's something here. I'm interested in it, and I want to pursue it. Uh, but I need to be able to use whatever I do. So, if you guys fail miserably at this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a film about you guys failing miserably okay. <laughs> at this. So, you, we have to, we have to release this to the world, where the, no matter what the outcome is. And um, yeah, they said yes, and I was like, "Well, this, this is brave. There's something brave here." Because had they failed miserably, it would have been so embarrassing. It would have been the most horrible thing. <laughs> and so the the stakes for them went higher because mm-hmm. I asked them this, and you know, all of a sudden the stakes of the film goes higher, and there's more emotion around and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And so yeah, it, um, that's how I found myself in in this in the, tangled up in this situation. Okay. Yeah, and- I definitely freaked out. We had to get papers in so that you would have a film. I freaked out so many times. <laughs> it's like Mike's gonna have no film. I mean, that I was gonna embarrass myself kind of didn't matter. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh no, Mike won't have a film. Yeah. We have to get papers. Oh, who even knows if it would have gone the same way if you hadn't entered the picture, though, Mike? Like for motivating. Yeah. Who knows? It's uh, yeah. Yeah, I should try and unpack that in the film, but no. Yeah, oh, Take well, enough. you can give me the credit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> okay. So, okay, so, Jim, I know that the Wall Street Journal, sorry, the, now we're moving to the part, or we have been moving to the part of the interview where I just have some curious questions of all the other interviews I've watched of you guys that I have not been answered. A Wall Street Journal outed you. How did mm-hmm. they find out about you? Um... There was actually a kind of a little, so it started again with, we got our inspiration to do this from new real peer review. And then we we realized right after our first paper got accepted, the dog park paper, it's literally the next day after that scene, everybody's seen where we're laughing. The next morning we all woke up in the cold light of morning. We're like, oh no, real peer review is going to tweet that paper out and we're finished. We had this panic meeting in Portland walking to, Pete's car um, where he'd parked it so we could get to the train or whatever. And we're talking, what are we going to do? And so eventually what happened was new real peer review tweeted out the paper and they made an awful lot of fun of it. And it got an awful lot of attention. I think it got about 20 times the attention most of their stuff gets. Mm -hmm. I was looking at it with a bit of a curious eye at the time. And um, so that's picked up interest in this kind of whole network of you know the outlets like campus reform and and 
the college fix and all of these different kinds of ones that watch what's going on on campus and just publish, you know, what absurdity is coming out of campus now. And so they all started running the story and th- about this paper, knowing nothing about it except how crazy it was. Mm-hmm. And then the National Review did a story about it and some other bigger outlets. And we started to get kind of panicky. And the next thing you know, it seemed to just die down. But this one journalist wouldn't leave it alone and pick and pack and pack. And I guess it's a thing in journalism. Maybe Mike can speak more to this. Than I. If you want to get interest for your story, if you believe there's a story, there and you want to get more interest around your story and it's not really going anywhere you try to get a bigger journalist to write about it because it brings more interest into it so that journalist actually called the journalist on the the lower journal yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so the wall street journal was brought in by by a journalist calling her and uh telling her this there's a story here i know there's a story here look into it and at that point it sounds like a movie like i know there's this there's a scoop i know it (laughs) there it is a movie (laughs) it is and it is a movie the 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 stress that was going on behind the scenes it's it's it was fascinating to be part of like it's like it's like holy the wheels are coming off this thing there's journalists circling around it. There's ethical issues about, oh, should we continue to lie to these people that are coming? It's so, it's very cool. It's very cool. Yeah. So, That's stressful. Like so where would it have gone if it wasn't, um, the scoop wasn't too good? If it wasn't picked up by those journalists and the Wall Street Journal, wow, where would it, what would it have looked like? So there was an article that came out um, about a month after we went public or a couple of weeks after we went public, they kind of did a summary of it by a sociologist. And he analyzed what the status of our different papers were was at the time. And he said that he thinks that we would have at least had 11 that were accepted and published had we had time to see it through. My honest guess is that we probably would have had 12. Um, 13 was possible. 14 would not have happened. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, to guess that 11 or 12 of our 20 papers would have succeeded is um, fair and reasonable, although they would not necessarily have done so in exactly the final form that you know has been put out in that Google Drive with all the papers in it. Mm-hmm. They would have been edited, et cetera, from there. Uh, so there would have been pretty serious success. The goal from when we broke off to where when the Wall Street Journal called until uh, when we would have gone public, which would have been maybe what end of January, early February this year, we were going to actually gather that data, finish the papers. We we're going to try to analyze the data, understand what we had done in deeper terms, both academic and uh, you know more on a lay surface level. We were also going to try to figure out how to communicate this, which Mike was integral with. He was going to figure out like a series of videos, mm. maybe ones about the papers, certainly ones about us and what we did and why we did it. So there'd be this kind of suite We're of very materials. Much working on the back foot now, like it's it came yeah. out. We've got to figure out how to how to communicate it, and so people don't understand it properly. I don't think. Um, yeah, well, we, we, we did went, our best, and I think we did okay. But it's we did not, all right. We went from having six or seven months to plan to figure out what we had in front of us and to plan our communication strategy to having three weeks. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. And it just like flipped almost overnight. (laughs) Three weeks. And the three weeks weren't even guaranteed. And Mike was trapped in Australia with a visa issue and couldn't get to the United (laughs) States to film the the climax of his scary movie. Uh, Oh, yeah. And if, if it went, if it like... Because Wall Street Journal were, you know, they're not allowed to tell people when things come out. So there was this kind of thing hanging over us the whole time. Um, so it could have dropped at any moment. So, so I would have slept that first week of August, for example, which I didn't do. Uh, I slept maybe two hours a night. Oh, my gosh. That first week crazy. of August. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> stress was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I lost a lot of weight. <laughs> Yay, I guess. <laughs> I, don't know, I mean, yay for it. I, it? I had this weird thing where I was like tangled up in this, but I'm like, this is great for the film. I just want things to keep exploding and, and yeah, so, these so... horrible emotional roller coasters because I'm getting good stuff for the film. But then the other other foot I've got in the relationships with these guys and being connected to this thing. So it was, it was a weird experience for me. Like a weird double, like this is great, but also sorry guys. Like, yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah. Jim's dying, but that, yeah. that, that makes good footage. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> so would, would the documentary had it gone the way you had planned and then you revealed it, that would have been the reveal is the documentary. 
Uh, no, m- maybe not because the, the post release is, is very well, how people accept this project is a huge part of the documentary. And so it's still oh. going on. I mean, Pete's, Pete's still re- going through the ramifications of um, being part of this project with, with his job at PSU. So there's, there's still like the story is still, we're still living inside the film. Um, right. What's the update with Pete, by the way? Um, he still has his job at the moment or? Yeah, he has his job. So they're, they're going, they're going through, there were two charges. One, it was an ethical charge, not going through the IRB um, to gain permission, like going through the ethical board to gain permission to do this study. And um, they said that he's guilty of that. Mm-hmm. So that, that charge has gone to the, uh, the president mm. of the of PSU. Uh, and then there's he's right at the end of the secondary um, accusation, which was for this data fabrication. And he's got a lot of academic support, like Steven Pinker, um, Sapolsky, Peterson, all these, all these, uh, you know. And I saw Shermer, like Michael Shermer wrote. Like, Germa, they all, all these yeah. Stars yeah. Are really, yeah, really tons kind of, of people playing in saying you if you get him on this thing that's that's ridiculous like yeah. um, even so, Chomsky oh Chom- Chomsky yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, I like I wrote <laughs> a letter I'm like I'll be one of the masses letters oh well, you were in there as well cool yeah, cool. yeah it's like yeah public awesome. as well it's not just the rock stars it's like all the students and everything like that so it'd be very interesting to see what happens I I, I suspect that surely um he'll come uh, out it, of this it would be it would be crazy to do something um something drastic to him so we, we don't know where that's style going to anyway. go so that's not their style anyway okay is it just is this just a, to make a point well their style is to do to to not have anything that could be like a big mess where somebody could get a wrongful termination suit involved they like to turn little thumb screws and make people hate their lives instead and uh, and there's also, lots of past- so, like, let's so. not go too much us and them. Like, I think that, that there, there is an administrative uh, responsibility oh, to investigate this thing. I think that there's a, there's a lot of pressure from certain groups outside and inside the university. Yeah, both. Um, I think so. Mm-hmm. And, and they and, do need to do the investigation, sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so what, what they do with, with the information, we will speak a lot to, you know, w- how much sway this has – um, within the university and also how, how much they're listening to the outside world because the outside world's like, don't do anything to Pete. So, okay. I mean, if they double down and, and do something to Pete, then it's, it is very much a, a closed system that's not listening to anything that's outside of it. But um, I think that there, there, there's people caught up in this investigation that um, it seems to me that they're just trying to tick bureaucratic boxes and then okay. there are people who are out for blood who, mm. are, who are pressuring um, them to to do something. So there, there's a lot of people in there. I feel sorry for that are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. But we'll yeah. see. We'll well, see where it goes. Speaking of the outside world, I kind of think I, I'll maybe conclude, and who knows how long this conclusion will be, um, by asking, what does this mean? The Evergreen thing and the Grant Studies thing. Like, what do these? What is the implications for the outside world? What does it mean for us? Like, well, how should we view it? Should we be, con- I'm concerned. I mean, I know that mm. there's the, there's, there's trans athletes. We didn't even get into like the trans slash, uh, like feminist clashes, like hard, hard. Mm. We didn't even get into that. Yeah, I know. Cause that's too mm-hmm. long. It's too many things. But- well, yeah. And there, there's sort of things that I don't want to get into too much. Right. Like I'm interested in the, the, you know, who cheated on who I'm not interested in. The who dishes. did the okay. dishes? Okay, but so and so. so what do we think? So, what do we think about it? Though, like, what should? I think we're going to see more fights about dishes and who ate the last Tim Tam and and who who left the toilet seat up and like. So I think that there's a lot of. That's what we should be worried about because those are going to get more and more ferocious. Okay. If, if we don't try and sort this thing thing underneath it out, and I think if it spreads, if this schism spreads more and more and more and more and more and more, then all of a sudden maybe we'll have two different camps in every country. So you you think we will be starting to see it move beyond, say, the women's division of sports, which is kind of the most like and and educational certain things that kids are learning in the, like school. I know they're kind of filtering down. To I the think elementary. I think the, the scariest part of it is probably pedagogy, like all the all the educational literature. There's a lot of this stuff in it. Okay. Um, 
you know, whether whether it is the insane stuff or the more reasonable manifestations of it is a different discussion. But I think a, a, a very interesting indication of what power this philosophy has is it's tearing through the uh, the Christian denominations over in the US. Mm-hmm. So it's it's it, it operates underneath politics. So it operates on an, at like a theological level. So I I don't want to. I don't like to predict. Like I don't. I don't. Okay. I can. I can go. Oh, it's it's heading this way. It's heading that way. But I don't want to. Like it's it's to me. It's 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 so fascinating. And I I'm looking at it and um, I am concerned. But I'm here for the ride. Whatever whatever happens with it. What about you, Jim? Jim. What are you? Uh, I'm actually somewhat optimistic. I do think, though, that concern is the right word. Um, there has to be, this can't be ignored. It won't go away by itself. Uh, that said, I keep getting indications that the wind is shifting and that people are really getting tired of this and not just the alt right or whatever they like to accuse everybody who fights against it of being. There are a lot of reasonable people who are kind of, I mean, I've had professional serious professional people public people come to me and say okay so i'm definitely a liberal i definitely have concerns about racism in society i definitely care about social justice issues and i cannot get on board with the sjw's what do i do Mm. and so there is a shifting wind where that kind of thing is getting voiced. There's a shifting wind where you're starting to see, I just saw and retweeted something earlier about it. That there's a, there are colleges starting to stand up to some of these activists and they're not going to be the next evergreen. There mm. are, there Even are that, signs. That Middlebury student that, that, that uh, gave, so Middlebury student recorded some of this, this protesting, um, some, some protesters communicating with the faculty and some very interesting things he recorded and so he's getting into trouble but i was speaking to him recently um dominic is his name um and he he said that he's he's getting into trouble for secretly recording it but there there are a lot of faculty that are are surrounding him now and trying to help him and so this i think that there's this pushback within the academy where it was it was this thing was rolling over the academy but there's there's a there's a corrective force that's happening there as well like an awareness almost to be like we're not going to have the wool pulled over all right. Well, yeah, we're not just, we're just, you guys are going too far with this now. Go. Okay. This, this is, yeah, we're, we're not gonna I feel this. like there's a there's been a big shift. I mean, I we talked about it before we even went public um, with with our work that something had shifted and we were releasing our work into a more friendly field than we would have had we done so a year earlier. Yeah. And I I feel like that trend has actually continued. Um, I could be surrounding myself with the wrong people, but I think I'm yeah, reading the science. Thing. It's so hard. It's so it's it's extremely difficult to get these. I think the internet used to be easier to get like a kind of you used to be able to read it a little bit better, but now mm. um, there's so many things that, that are kind of bending your 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 view on on yes. these things. Like these data, your data points are all from a particular group a lot of the time. It's really hard to get outside of that. I mean, I'm hearing it from from people, everyday people on the ground that don't live too online, too. The other day, my wife had some friends over, and one of them described herself as, and I quote, liberal AF, and that was her exact phrasing. She said that phrase exactly, because I didn't censor oh, it. Oh, okay. And I'm liberal AF, and I was like, well, what did you think about the work I did? She was like, it is so needed. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I'm starting to see a lot more of that kind of thing. Like, I'm super, super to the left, but these crazy people, this ridiculous theory where everybody hates everybody all the time is not acceptable. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's I don't have hard evidence. This is all kind of anecdotal. But the feeling is when I stick my finger in the wind that it has shifted. But if we drop the ball and say, oh, everything's just going to be OK, that's not how this is. That's not how this game pl- is played. You know, that's. Yeah. It's important that we continue to do, as Mike said, and look at this philosophy and understand where it's coming from and why people think this way and to understand why it's perfectly acceptable not to play along with their uh, moral extortion and to, or to believe their, their claims that this is intellectually rigorous. Um, and so... I'm, po- I, you know, I'm positive in the sense of being optimistic that if we continue to have these kinds of conversations, 
on bigger and bigger scales that sooner or later the wind's properly going to shift. You're going to see enough reasonable people kind of wake up and start to really put this into effect. I'm, I get emails at least three or four a week, but it's often more than that from some new walk of life, whether it's knitting outdoors groups, uh, you know, you name it. I can't even think of all the ones that it's, Oh, this has totally taken over this knitting? organization that I'm involved in knitting. Oh, oh knitting yeah. I always oh, forgot about that one. It was a, it was a, a while ago. What, what was the knitting problem? Like what was the, problem? Oh, the, the, the groups, like the online communities around these hobbies. And it's worse when it's like outdoor groups because they're like, they really get together and do things. Have somebody that the dynamics pretty straightforward. Somebody comes in, there's a number of people who are, are kind of woke as it is. Some incident happens and somebody goes full woke about it. And then that fractures a community around a polarizing issue. And then the whole thing turns into this kind of political fighting about woke issues. And then the, most of your middle of the road people are in a hobby group or whatever. They don't want any of that. So they just stop participating. Okay. Um, I watched this happen with the atheist movement, which is probably how we had the insights Peter and I had the insights in Helen as early as we did because this same thing played out you know the evergreen implosion happened as the atheist movement implosion first um, oh. you had social justice activists come in and everything got really toxic and split around this one polarizing issue and so then you had the people for it you had the people against it and most of the people in the middle were just like I don't really want to participate in this war zone mm. so they kind of dip out and then it you know, they have conferences and stuff. Nobody's going to them because either it's going to be a big fight between the SJWs and everybody else or is going to, uh, you know, somebody's going to get accused of sexual misconduct for nothing or something. Yeah, I, think, I think the, and, the interesting thing to me that, that, that makes apart. me pos positive is that how lame it is. Like, it's just... It's, it's just, so lame. It's when... See, it's just boring and lame and it's it just makes people dicks and it's there's just nothing cool about it. Yeah, and, and so it's, since it's when like, has authoritarianism been like cool? There's just there's there's it's, it's since it's, I think it's, Russia, it's yeah. quite easy just to point out and go, hey, hey, look at this, guys! Like, what wh what are you doing? This is the this is the lamest thing, and it doesn't have any academic backing. There's just there's nothing here, and so if you can yeah. just show people that, which I think will happen more and more, okay. and yeah. good, good good left people you know what i mean like like people on the team of the people that are kind of getting pulled toward the, this extreme yeah. um if they start if they start just pointing at it and going hey look like let's not just take a step outside and look how these people are behaving it's it's just yeah. lame yeah that was the other was thing ask about the how do you deconvert right like the people uh, who are well, you burst the bubble, right? You just show them what they're doing. Like, you don't even have... You just film it and show it back to them and say, hey, this is what happened. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do anyway. Right. And the other yeah. thing is, is, you can just point... Like, it's there. It's all there to see. I mean, it's... You just, you just point people in the right direction. Once you understand the, the language games and everything that they're playing, you look underneath it and, uh, as uh, Heather, Heather Hying says, there's no there there. And so that's what makes me confident is that you just you can just show people it's it's not um, yeah I mean you know there's there's the deepest darkest elements of it where people are fully indoctrinated but I think mm -hmm. that the, the the pull the pull of of the mass of people toward it um, we can we can stop that pull by just showing like showing them in this kind of lucid um, rational terms and just, and really really kind of identify what's going on there. Okay, uh, Jim. No, I think that's right. I think that's how you kind of burst the bubble and you, you let people see what it is and explain how it works and why it works that way. Uh, I'm really encouraged also that I see a lot of people trying um, both right and left and Christian and non-Christian, etc., trying to reach across the table and shake hands and say, you know. This has been a movement where it's making everything political has been the operation. Mm. And so you're now seeing people saying, you know what, let's set aside everything being political and let's try to be friends. Mm. Let's think about community. Let's think about na being neighbors. Let's have a barbecue. And so I'm seeing this kind of counter movement that I would really like to foster that's basically just being friends. This is really <laughs> weird concept of yeah. you know being yeah. friends with people different. Yeah. Think differently than you are. Yeah. Or, no, I think it's it's we've been pulled into this world where it's very us and them, 
Mm. It's like there's no there's no them. There's just different versions of us. And mm. if we can just kind of if we can push that um, push that more and that that way of being, um, I think that we might be able to correct this this extreme tr- political tribalism we're in. Okay. But who knows? So easy- who knows where it'll go? It's 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 a weird thing. Okay. The easiest thing to do is just point out evidence of this stuff. If you want to help, it's you know, find don't don't go on Twitter or whatever you go on YouTube or wherever and just start ranting. Just go find you know a paragraph out of their books. Don't misquote it. Just read it. <laughs> this is what these people actually say. <laughs> this is what they want your school to teach. You know. <laughs> and, the, and the scholars you've mentioned a number of them. Like so, there's Robin D'Angelo. Oh, who yeah. else did you? Who else did you? Uh, I mean, if you want to see that pedagogy of discomfort, that's um, that's Megan Bowler. Okay. Yeah, if you want to horrify yourself, look up pretty much anything by Barbara Applebaum. Okay. Um, Allison Bailey is one that got mentioned, and it, you know, you can just go on and on and on, and there's so many. Christy Dotson's one, but she's quite reasonable, just kind of caught in the system. Okay. Um, yeah. So sometimes it's hard. Much. Like, I mean, sometimes I read it, and it's 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 it, it it's not. It's not obvious where where the you know philosophical problems in it are, and it's it's as as we said, it comes to you with a smile. So, right, de- def- definitely look at it. I mean, if you want to see the the craziest manifestations of it, um, the New Real Peer Review, they're doing a really good job of um, yeah, just documenting what's going on with the the strangest, this the really strangest version of it. Okay, or read feminist glaciology. Go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. an experience. Okay. Okay. That is a bad experience. So I, I, well, it's a good place to end. No. Yeah. I think I think actually this is I I really am looking forward to seeing the documentary. Um. Of well, yeah. I, I've already seen the Evergreen one, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing the Grievance Studies one. You don't. I think I saw you uh, tell Benjamin Boyce that you're you're just going to be working on it. You're not going to have a deadline. You're you're wanting to see yeah. it through. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to go because I mean the, the Evergreen one is it was an accidental series mm-hmm, like it's, mm-hmm. it's it was supposed to be a a, uh, a a scene so it just it just turned into something I was like oh, I'll just put it out mm. but the film the film I need to think about more right. I think so I'm just gonna take my time and um, you know I'm working on a few different things at the moment but it'll 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 get there yeah <laughs> no I'm I'm looking forward to it yeah I'm seeing yeah yeah seeing well. I mean, we just solved the world's problems, guys, in yeah, this sure. nice chat. So, but no, really, I so really like do. going over these things. It's it's good to hear you guys feeding off each other. So this is a this is a successful first three three person chat that I've tried. So thank you for oh. being on. No yeah, worries, thanks, thanks for having us. us.